What did getting out of hand look like? Not being present and not being able to, to do the things that I needed to do as a husband and a father. Um, I mean, I was functional, but uh, barely at some points. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? How, I, thanks for having me. It's a great joy to have you. I'm so glad. I enjoyed talking to you so much last time. I'm glad we get to do it in real life. Me too. Me too. It's a little different in person, right? I know. I'm, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. All the mag- magic's gone now. Yeah, yeah, they take off the filters in real life, yeah, and that's right? what, that's what no, happens. I hope there's filters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have radio filters on. Don't worry about it. Um, how was last? You played Boots and Hearts last night in yeah. Ontario. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, I mean, I always, look, Canada's always been great to me in general throughout my entire career. In fact, when I, when I first started playing music, before I even had a hit, I'd had maybe my first top 40 single, and I told my... my uh, booking agent, I said, book me in Canada at the coldest time of year. I want to go in the coldest time of year. My reasoning was, since I didn't have a big hit, if you book me at the coldest time of year, they'll go see anybody just to get out of the house <laughs> because everybody's it's so cold, everybody's locked in the house. So if you show up, they'll come see it. And, and it worked? And it worked. And ever since early in my career, we have sold out places in Canada's Always shown up for me ever since. Did you really play like cold? Oh, all the ice hockey arenas, yeah, yeah, and the cold as it was. I mean, I mean, as cold as I mean, we were in Moncton, I think, one time. Yeah, and it was. I mean, it, the like the engines were freezing up on the buses. It was so cold. Because you're from Louisiana. Louisiana, right? yeah. yeah. So I'm not. I don't know much about ice. No. I'm from Louisiana. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it worked out. Some say that's the secret to your success is touring. I've often told people the secret to success in country music is touring Canada in the winter. I agree. Well, there you go. I've started a trend, maybe. You You've had um you've had a long career now. Yeah, thirty something years. I started when I was twelve though, so <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say, you know, you're looking good for your early forties. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is um I say that because this album feels a little bit um more contemplative than I'm uh, I'm used to from you. I mean lo- looking back a little bit. Can we just listen to a little bit sure, of Sure, yeah. Take absolutely. take a listen to this. I wanna live a McGraw and Standing Room Only. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm hearing you on that song. Think about mortality a little bit. Yeah, you know, I'm, to me, the song's not about the end game as much as it is about the game, about how you live your life and um, the way you live your life. And, and you know, and that you make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. I'm going to continue to make some mistakes and probably bad ones. But, you know, all you can do is get up the next day and try to do the next best thing. And I think that that's what that song's all about to me. It's about just sort of you know, trying to leave a mark in some way. You know, we all live our lives by the scale a little bit, and we hope at the end of the day that the good side of the scale outweighs the bad side of the scale, even if it's just a little bit. Is that on your mind more than usual? Yeah, you know, you, when you're, you're, you know, I have a three daughters, a 26-year-old, a 25-year-old, and almost 22-year-old. Man, oh man. And so you start looking at their lives, and you start looking about, thinking about when you're gone, what are they going to remember about you? And what are they going to think, you know? And so those those things start creeping into your mind as you get older, for sure. And then you you know you look for songs that that sort of sort of tell that story a little bit. But I think also throughout my career, I've always I've always had that side of me that searched for songs that have a deeper meaning, and songs that have something to say. Um, I'm pretty hard on songs. I mean, I my process, <clears throat> whenever I'm getting prepared, because I'm a songwriter as well, although. Most of the time, my songs don't make the record, but every now and then I, I get lucky and hit a home run with one. But my process is I always have these ideas about the kind of music I want to uh, listen to or want to sing or the kind of music I want the album to be about, um, sonically and lyrically. So I'll sit down and I'll start writing songs t- in the direction that I want the album to go. And on this on this album, I sat down and because I had you know, Here on Earth came out as you mentioned earlier during COVID. And so we didn't get to go out and play that music live that often, or very much at all. And so I immediately started preparing for the next album, looking for songs and writing songs. So I started writing these songs, going down the line of what I wanted. And sure enough, what happens is I'll write songs, and I'll think, I mean, these are four or five pretty good songs. They, they say what I want to say. And then I'll start getting demos in from my favorite songwriters, and I'll go, well, damn, 
that's exactly what I wanted to say, but it's way better than my songs, and my song goes in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you find you were writing about when you were doing that? Just writing about life. I wanted to have some, a lot of life-affirming songs, songs about, you know, you know, living better, you know, being a better person, pushing forward, sort of enlightening in a lot of ways. But, you know, there's also some fun songs. There's also some nostalgia sort of songs looking back on your life a little bit, too. Um, Remember Me Well, for instance, is, is you know, about a, a relationship, you know, a, a quick relationship or a relationship that you have for somebody that didn't work out, but you want it to be remembered fondly, mm. those kind of things. So you, you think about those parts of your life. And, and you also think about, like I said earlier, you think about your life, your kids' lives unfolding and the things that they're going to go through. And I always picture when I'm in the studio and I'm, I'm recording, I always picture trying to have a conversation with someone. And, and you can tell somebody how you feel, and you can sort of sing at somebody or sing to somebody, but if you can sing a song and tell somebody how they feel, and they didn't realize they felt that way till they heard it, or they wish that they, they had a moment in time where they wish they had those words to say to somebody, and I think that's what music does. Instead, like if you, if you get lost <laughs> you know, in, in something that you want to say to a friend or to a spouse or to a loved one, and you can't find the right words, you have always got a great song to, yeah. play, to play for them. I mean, that's, that's a gift to the people who are listening to it in your Yeah, mind. and it's a gift to me as well because it, it's, it's cathartic for, for the artist. I think in a lot of ways we're very fortunate. I mean, you're an artist as well. It's very, we're, you're very fortunate to, to be able to express yourself that way and sort of it's, it's, it's therapy in a lot of ways for you. So when you're in the studio and you're singing these songs, if you don't feel it, and if you don't internalize it, and if you don't sort of find that connection with the song, there's no way you're going to make anybody else connect with it. Well, let's let's play a song. I think that that demonstrates uh, that we even have some of those comments uh, ourselves. Just take a listen to this. All I ever did was give you my attention. Every Friday night since I turned 22. Trusted you with my naive intentions. Hey, whiskey, what I ever do to you? That's a Tim McGraw and Hey Whiskey. Tim, I love that song. Oh, thank you. I do too. Yeah. I when I first saw it on the on the track list, I thought it would be. I mean, there's a, there is sort of sort of a fun drinking song kind of early on. The paper paper umbrellas. The paper thing? umbrellas. I really like that. That's my ode to George Strait kind of. Yeah, yeah. 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 Pina coladas. It's, yeah. it's a bit of fun. And then, so when I saw Hey Whiskey there, I sort of thought, you know, oh, okay, well, here's another kind of fun, fun drinking mm-hmm. song. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what that song's about? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it makes whiskey, it personalizes whiskey. It turns it into sort of this, this live thing and this uh, live demon that you're battling. And, and it talks about being your best friend or your worst enemy. Um, and anybody that knows my story knows that that's something that I've dealt with in my life. And and it's and it's never been it's not, you know it hasn't been a linear process at all you know there's times where I've failed and probably times where I'll fail again but it's something that you're always striving to to do better at. Um, can, can you tell me as much as you want? Can I ask you about that? Yeah, I mean, you can know, you tell me a little bit about your story with that? Well, I went through a long time where I was just out of hand. You were yeah, drinking. I was drinking too much. Well, well you were and playing, among other things. You, you were know. playing like I mean, you were like a, a college athlete, and you were you know. You were uh, uh, playing bars and stuff like that. There's a lot of booze around. You a know? lot of booze around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, you know, starting out in college, is, is not <laughs> floating kegs is not a good, <laughs> yeah. good way to start your life out. But <laughs> some people overcome it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, then you know, playing bars, and then all of a sudden moving to Nashville, and, and we're we're traveling all over the country in a, a U-Haul van. I'm in a U-Haul in a van, and playing these small bars and clubs six, seven nights a week. You know, playing four or five hours a night, and it you know, it, it turns into a crutch after a while and um it got out of hand for a long time until my wife finally put her foot down and said that uh you know it's time to stop and uh, i did i i uh sort of went cold turkey and dropped everything for about 10 years and uh covid sort of got me a little discombobulated for a little bit you had a little you had a little little uh, fall back but but, uh you know nothing that i can't handle what did getting out of hand look like not being present and not being able to, to do the things that I needed to do as a husband and a father. Um, I mean, I was functional, but uh, barely at some points. It, it, was, it was just the lifestyle. It was, it was the lifestyle that you thought you were supposed to have, you know, being a rock star. Yeah. And it's just, it's just this deceiving thing. 
and it's this this uh, deceptive confidence that you get from it. Yeah, you know, and um, where it's actually taking your confidence away, and you don't realize it. What was the hardest part about stopping? Wondering if you could still be good. Good Wonder at good you, at music. Yeah, good, good at, at music. Wonder if you could still find your muse. You know. Yeah. And find what inspires you, and find. You know, I'm pretty base. I'm basically a pretty shy person. I'm a reserved person. Yeah. And uh, me too. By the way, we both have weirdly public jobs for people who <laughs> right, are very exactly. shy, introverted people. I know, yeah. and so I think in a lot of ways that sort of opened more up of myself and made me a little more uh, flamboyant, I guess, on stage. So when you stop drinking, you're thinking, okay, can I even face people? Yeah, Can I, can exactly. I have conversations? Can, can I stand on stage? Can I have conversations? Can I stand on stage and and you know? do the kind of performance that I'm used to doing and come to find out it works out pretty good. What was the biggest improvement? Uh, pr- certainly singing. <laughs> you mm-hmm. can stay on pitch a lot better when, <laughs> when, when you can focus. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think my music's gotten better um, over the years. Um, and I think that's been the ultimate goal other than my family. Uh, professionally, the ultimate goal for me is to always, you know, honor my craft and, I was getting to a point to where I wasn't honoring my craft. I think I wasn't giving it as much attention. You know, you get you, there's sometimes where you you start being successful successful and you have a lot of success that you think that it doesn't really matter what you do. You're still going to be successful, and it just doesn't happen that way. If you got to constantly improve, constantly put work in it, and constantly nurture your craft. And and every time I go in the studio and every time I record a record, every time I do a show, I want to get better. I want to improve. I want to. I still think I have a lot to learn and still think I have a lot of headroom for improvement. And the minute that I go into the studio and record an album and finish it and think that it's not better than my last record yeah. is the minute that I should probably consider not doing it anymore. When you say you're hard on songs, what did you mean by that? Well, I'm look, I'm, I just, songs are the most important thing that you can have as an artist. And you have to, you have to be diligent about the songs that you're choosing and the songs that you're recording. And, you know, more, more than anything, you got to know what, you, what you, you're not capable of and what isn't going to work for you. It's easy to find what works for you. Sometimes it's harder to, the hardest decisions you make are knowing what's not good for you. And when you figure that out, when you know what's not going to work for you, that's the biggest gift that you can have as an artist. Are there, are there criteria? Do you know right away? Are there things you won't sing about? I don't know. If, I, I, couldn't put my, I couldn't sit here and tell you, I won't sing about that or I won't sing about that. It's just when you hear the song, you'll know. And they have to viscerally hit me. I mean, whether I'm writing a song, like there's one song on this album that I, that I co-wrote on. But when I'm writing a song, I, I sort of know what I want to say and what I, and what I don't want to say. But when I'm getting songs in from other songwriters, I, yeah, I just have to listen to the song and realize that if it doesn't strike me viscerally and doesn't strike me deeply into where I feel like I can take that song and own it and make it mine and make you feel like nobody else can do that song, then that's the magic of the song. And if I don't find that and if I don't do that, there's no way it's going to reach anybody else. Well, that, going back to what you were saying about these songs being a conversation and these mm-hmm. songs trying to reach other people, I went to uh, YouTube and saw the acoustic version of, of your song, and uh, of Hey Whiskey. And I, I actually isolated a couple of comments. Okay. As the daughter of a recovered alcoholic, a mother of a 23-year-old alcoholic son working on his recovery, and myself once upon a borderline alcoholic, this song hits my heart deep. Mm-hmm. I'll give you one more. My dad celebrated 33 years of sobriety this year. He stopped drinking when my mom told him she'd had enough. Mm-hmm. He chose his family over the booze, and they celebrate 54 years together. I have never identified more to your music than I have this song. Oh, wow. What does that mean to you? It means everything. It means everything. I mean, to know that you have a part in someone's life because of your music is, is the biggest honor that you can ever get as an artist. Um, I, I, for instance, when we're doing Live Like You Are Dying in concert, to me, I feel like I'm just sort of the vessel that that song comes through because it's just as cathartic for me as it is for everyone else. And when I'm singing that song, I feel so grateful and so fortunate that I was able to record that song because when I look out at the audience, I'm going to get a little of a clamp here when I start talking about it. When I look out at the audience and I'm singing that song and then you see 
maybe a family or a couple and they're all hugging and crying. Yeah. And you realize that they had gone through a terrible experience in their life and that that song was important to them at that time. And you see those reactions and you can just look and you can imagine these little vignettes of these people's lives that that song was important to them during. And um, it really means means everything to me. That's why that's why you make music. I mean, isn't that just a little bit of shared humanity there? Because like I know last time you were here, we talked about uh, Live Like You Were Dying. Mm-hmm. We talked about your dad. We talked about yeah. Doug McGraw, you know, legendary pitcher. Yeah. Um, and we talked, and you know, who you, you got famously, and we talked about this last time famously, you, you got to know kind of late in life. You know, you didn't know he was your dad for the first, what, 18? Well, I, I didn't know he was my dad until I was 11. 11 years I found years my birth old. certificate. <clears throat> and I met him once then, and then I didn't get to know him until... Gosh, 18, 19 years old. I, I remember hearing that story that, yeah. he, that his name was crossed out of the. Yeah, his name was scratched out, and then my stepdad's name was written in ink, handwritten above it. And I never knew, and I found my birth certificate and found out everything one afternoon and called my mom from work. And she drove home. She just, you could tell on the other end of the phone, she was like, oh my gosh. Like, oh my gosh, you were never supposed to find out? I don't know if I was, I don't know that if I was, I was ever going to find out or not. That's the truth. I really haven't asked my mom if she, if she was ever going to tell me. I mean, I, I'm sure she probably was. She just, I mean, I can't imagine how difficult that must have been for her to hold that in Yeah. for so long, especially knowing what all she went through in the relationship with my stepfather. It was very abusive and very dysfunctional. And, um, and, that, and now looking back, when I found that out, it made a lot of sense of why I caught the brunt end of a lot of that. Yeah. She sounds like a strong woman. She's a very strong woman. She's my hero. Yeah. What's her name? Betty. Betty? Yeah. What's her last name? Her, well, her last name's Trimble now. She's married to a great man. They've been married for 25, 30 years. But her maiden name's D'Agostino. So, so I'm Italian and Irish. So I'm either fighting or crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. I love this. I mean, people, people, the story is well known, but I love the story that when you, when you finally, so like my, my understanding of the story is that there's a, college comes up, try and find some, some dough for college. Mm-hmm. Your, your parents don't have a whole lot of money. You're, you're going to write Tug McGraw, who at this point has never fully admitted to being your dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he says, okay, I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll give you some money as long as you never talk to me again. Well, that's what happened. It was um, <clears throat> my last high school football game. And my mom had sent a letter to Tug's lawyer. I think she tracked down who his lawyer was and sent a letter and says, you know, Tim wants to go to college. We can't afford it. I, I can't afford it. She was a single mom at the time. She said, I can't afford it. Would you help out? And, of course, he never acknowledged that he was my dad. And so I'm run out on the field. You know how you bust through the paper and you run out on the field on the football game? Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go out and start playing. And so my mom comes down on the field on the sidelines, and I'm about to go out and play. And she taps me on the shoulder. She says, well, I heard from Tug's lawyer today. I'm like, Mom, <laughs> right now? <laughs> You're going to tell me this right now? And she gave me a little spill. She said, so we'll talk about this when we get home tonight. So we not actually had a really good game that night, my very last game. I was going to say, yeah. you, you either had a bad game or a good no, game. I had a really good game yeah. that night. Um, I think I was fired up for a lot of reasons, more anger than anything probably. But, um, yeah, there was a, it, they had sent a contract and said that um, I, think it, I think it was something like he would give me $150 a month. And not much money. To, when I was in school. Yeah. And um, I told my mom that night when we uh, late at night, we were sitting up talking and, you know, we were both pretty, you know, emotional. And I said, tell them that I will sign the contract and I'll never bother him again. But he has to see me one last time. And so we agreed to meet in Houston, which oddly enough was the only time I ever saw him pitch. And and the first time I had met him when I was 11. And uh, so we went to Houston and my mom had to borrow a car, just like she did the very first time, borrow a car to drive to Houston and borrow some money from her boss for us to be able to get there. And we drove, and we walked into the hotel, and Mom says, well, there's Tug right there standing at the desk. And so I said, I'm going over to say hi. And at this time, I was the same height as him. Well, yeah, this is where I love this story. And I looked just like him, and he had his lawyer with him. And I tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around, and he looked at me, and his lawyer looked at me. And his lawyer's face went completely white because he couldn't. It was 
at that point, there was no denying because we were almost identical. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't say much it's, at that point. You know, could the, he? the defense lawyers, you could see his shoulders just slump. His face go <laughs> like, this, is, this isn't going to work out my, like we planned. My, my case is out the window. <laughs> Given that is like staring into a mirror know, here right. between these two dudes. So um, we ended up spending the day together. I think we played tennis a little bit that day, which. I'm from Louisiana. What do I know from tennis? Yeah. And so we played a little bit of tennis that day, and then he asked if we would go to dinner that night. And Mom and I said, of course. And so we're having dinner, and I halfway through dinner, we were finished dinner, getting ready for dessert, and I asked Mom, I said, Mom, do you mind letting Tug and I have a few minutes together? And of course, being Mom, she was like, oh, no, no, I'm staying right here. I'm protective. Not, she's being protective of me. So I got it. I got it. This is fine. And so... We sat there in silence for about five minutes just looking at each other. And I finally said, I said, look, I'm happy to sign this contract. I'll get out of your hair. Um, it's not about the money. You know, I can, I'll can. i work three jobs if I have to. It's not, not a big deal. I just want to know, do you think you're my father? Wow. And, and he said, yeah, I think so. I know so. Yeah. And I said, well, that's fine. That's all I needed to know. I'll sign the paper tomorrow. And he goes, you know what? Forget about it. We're tearing that up. We're tearing it up. He said, I want you to be part of my family. And then I didn't hear from him for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that part. Of it. <laughs> but about a year later, he finally calls. He says, look, I'm bringing my family to Florida. At that point, he was married. and yeah. you know, He had a, a son and a daughter. Yeah. I said, I'm taking my family to Florida, you know, during the Philly spring training. He wasn't playing at the time. But he said, we're going to go out down and hang out during Philly spring training. Would you like to come visit and meet my family? And I'd never been on an airplane before. And I said, sure. And he said, and you can bring a friend with you. So I took my best friend, Lance Butler, who was my coach's son. And we were best friends all through high school and college as well. But um, So Lance and I flew down and got off the plane, and they were all there to meet me my brother and sister and Tug and his wife. Yeah. And we ended up having a great time hanging out together. What a, what a gift to be given to another family at that stage. Yeah, of life, I mean, you know? look, <clears throat> I get all the time I, I get asked, you know, how could you have nothing but animosity towards your father? You know, here you are growing up dirt poor in Louisiana with no money, broken down cars. And he was a very, very famous and he's and very famous. He's on TV all the time. And, you yeah. know, I would I would – glue myself to the TV anytime the Phillies were, were playing just to get a chance to watch him pitch and yeah. during the playoffs and everything. And I didn't tell a lot of people about it. I mean, only my closest friends even knew about the whole situation. Um, I just didn't talk about it. And I was embarrassed at some point just because I thought, well, he's not acknowledging me. There must be something wrong with me. So if I tell anybody that, they'll think, what's wrong with you that he's not acknowledging yeah, me? Why doesn't he want you? That kind of But thing. I'll tell you the reason I tell everybody that whether we had a relationship or not, Coming from the background that I had <clears throat> and the family situation that I had, um, with the exception of my strong mother and my sisters, who I loved dearly, um, the, the stepdad situations that we had were so, so terrible yeah. that um, when I found that birth certificate, I instantly thought, I can do something with my life. If, but if he can do that, and he's my father, then there's something in me that I can do that. He gave me a gift. He gave me an inspiration to think that I can make something out of my life. And I became instantly better at everything that I did. I gained confidence. Well, that, that going back to what you were saying before, I mean, what I, I understand it fully because when you're looking out into the audience and, and you're singing that song and you're watching people have, you didn't say like individual moments. You said like, I'm watching families have moments together. Mm -hmm. It's because you know what that's like. Yeah. You know how complicated families can be, how complicated grief can be, how complicated love and loss and everything else can be. And you're able to share that with them in yeah. that moment. It's not just about watching them have it. It's about sharing it with it's them. It's sharing it with them and feeling it as well. And <clears throat> and it it inspires me. You know, it it, it makes me think that, you know, I'm not just sort of a clown up here jumping around. Somebody's getting something out of it, and I am too. I got I got one minute left, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask. Uh oh, here we go. The, no, no, the biggest. <clears throat> so, have you been paying attention to this Taylor Swift tour? Yeah, we went and saw it. Um, I took a couple of my daughters and my wife in Nashville. In Nashville, yeah, yeah. big. I saw it was it. fantastic. I mean, she's great. Did she sing? 
No, she didn't sing Tim McGraw. Yeah, she did. I think she does did different throwback songs every night, but I think she did it earlier in the tour. But she she didn't sing that. What What do you make of that? What do you make that? Uh, like, what did you make of it when you found out that she at had the a song? time? Yeah, yeah. At the time, I was still long in my career, but I still thought I was early in my career. And gosh, that was how many years ago? I don't even know now how many years ago that was. But I thought, oh my gosh, have I have I gotten that long in the tooth that? artists are singing songs with my name in it that's can't be a good sign yeah know, for, you, for my longevity it's like that what's that what's that song uh that ain't how hank would it you know yeah, like yeah i don't think hank done it this way yeah you're yeah. like that you're yeah, like, that like now, oh yeah. boy yeah. here we go now they're pushing me out the door um but then someone told me well she was 15 and she wrote it in math class that made me feel a lot better so i didn't feel so bad then and then i then i heard the record and loved it and met taylor and and she opened up for faith and i on uh, our soul to soul tour one year and just her an acoustic guitar out on stage before we came out. And we, we knew really early on that this girl was going to blow the world up. Did you know it was going to get this big, though? I, who Nobody can know that. But every artist will tell you that on one hand, they think they're going to fail miserably. On the other hand, they think they're going to be the biggest act that's ever hit the scene. You gotta, it's a dichotomy that we have in our minds. You know, that we, you, it, I think one fuels the other. It must be interesting, though, to watch that happen from a country artist to become yeah, the biggest it, artist that's ever lived. I love it. I mean, I, I think I think it probably exposed always when, when someone, I mean, you know, Faith got beat up pretty badly for it. For what? For crossing over. She made a big crossover yeah, from Yeah, she made a big crossover. Pop, yeah. And at that time, people really frowned on that in country music. They wanted to put their thumb on it. And to me, I never understand that because all it does is open the door for people to learn more about country music. You did that collaboration with Nelly. Yeah. Over and over again. It's all in my head. Remember, yeah. Over and over again. Jam, by the yeah. way. And now, um, collaborations between country musicians and, and hip hop artists mm-hmm. is kind of the norm. Yeah, a lot what, of people are doing it. Yeah. You have people like Sam Hunt adding you know, mm-hmm. trap beats to his music. You have a Florida Georgia Line. Actually, they did a song with, with Nelly. With Nelly, yeah. I bet you got a little bit of pushback for that back then when you were trying to, when you were crossing over a, a little bit. A bit. I don't remember it being too bad, though. And, you know, that song was never intended to be a single, I don't think. It was just something that he called, and we got in the studio one day, and he had already had the tracks done, and we were sort of writing the lyrics out as we were doing it. And um, I did my part and left and didn't hear anything back until the record came out. And I think he had dropped another single, but when the album dropped, everybody started picking that song up. So... You know, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a country artist that had a hip hop number one <laughs> in like 36 different countries. So. But I also think you were a pioneer of the sound that's happening right now in country music with them. Yeah, maybe. Um, uh, for me, it, it was just fun at the time and fun to do something different and to collaborate with somebody cool like that because who I was a fan of. Um, I don't. I don't want to. Hopefully, I didn't contribute to some of the sound of country, some of the country music. <laughs> 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 but, but, uh, You'll take responsibility for the uh, good, the good in the country music. Yeah, I'll right take now. responsibility for the good part. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of great artists out there in country music. There's a lot of. I mean, I'm a fan of music in general. Yeah. In, any genre. Anybody yeah. that's good. Mm-hmm. Any music that's good. It's just good. You know. I think right now, more than ever, we're really seeing that. Um, that that even though you're still young and still plugging away at it, still early, still spry, the, still spry, <laughs> uh, your your influence is still being felt in music to this day. Um, it's a great joy to have you, and I wish I could talk to you forever. But uh, thanks for coming in, man. I Thank really you, appreciate man. it. Enjoyed it, Tom.